Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a psychotherapist and author based in West Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictions. Welcome to our podcast, which I call It's Not About the Sex, also the title of my recent book. Here we focus on all topics related to compulsive sexual behavior, often referred to as sex addiction. In particular, we explore ways to build long-term sustainable recovery while establishing more meaningful connection and greater intimacy. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints, brand new perspectives, and practical user-friendly tools toward living a more deeply connected life. Let's get started. Matthew Goldenberg, D.O., is a double board certified in psychiatry and addiction psychiatry and is a certified medical review officer. Dr. Goldenberg is an expert in the evaluation and treatment of mental health disorders and is an addiction specialist for adults in his private practice in Santa Monica, California. And I'm really pleased to have you with us, Dr. Goldenberg. Thank you so much for joining us. That's great to be here. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think especially at this time where we're all part of an unusual moment in history, the, the pandemic, it's, it's a time where I believe there's a lot of vulnerability to mental health issues and addiction issues. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. So again, just so glad you could be with us. And today's topic is psychopharmacology and addiction recovery. So first of all, for our listeners who may not know, I'm wondering if you can talk for a moment about how someone might have both mental health issues and addiction issues and, and, and what shows up in your office. Sure. You know, I think that's a really good place to start. I think sometimes when we think about addiction or we think about mental health is we think about them as two separate things. And what I often see is that there's a little bit of both when a patient comes to me for help. They might be drinking too much. They might be using drugs, you know, whether it be illicit drugs or prescribed medications, you know, more than they want or they're having trouble stopping them. Uh, but they also have other things that often play a role in the fact that they've developed a drug or alcohol problem. So a common theme I see is that a lot of people will use drugs and alcohol to escape, cope, or reward themselves. And oftentimes they're self-medicating depression or anxiety or PTSD or some other mental health condition. And so one of the jobs that I have when I meet with patients is really try to understand everything that's going on. Because if we only look at their mental health issues and we don't deal with the addiction, or we only focus on the addiction and we don't look at their underlying mental health issues, we often don't see the all the pieces of the puzzle that we need to put together in order to get them healthy as well as you know sober from drugs and alcohol. So uh, I would say the majority of my patients have both. And sometimes there's a little bit more addiction issues and sometimes it's a little bit more mental health issues. But ultimately, it's important to look at both and make sure we're addressing both if we want to treat the whole patient. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing you correctly, if we circle back to something you said, really addictions are often an attempt to feel better. And and so it, it becomes a, a vicious cycle that, that the addiction really is a way of coping, but eventually it doesn't work so well. That's what I see. And, you know, I don't know if that's true in all cases, but I think it's true in a lot of cases. I mean, we sometimes will be introduced to pain med because we want to feel better after we you know, break a clavicle in a ski injury. And all of a sudden now we're, you know, finding ourselves addicted to opiates and we were just trying to get relief and feel better from pain. Or we have a loved one who dies and we've started drinking at night to kind of take the edge off. And then all of a sudden we go from feeling better uh, to, you know, having a problem with substances. And so, you know, initially I find that people go in, you know, are introduced to a substance with no intention of getting addicted or using it inappropriately. They just feel better. And then, you know, we know from a biological standpoint, when we look at the brain chemistry, that part of the brain that feels better starts relying more and more heavily on those substances to just feel normal. And then all of a sudden, without the drugs or the alcohol, you feel awful. And so then you find you're using those drugs or alcohol again just to feel back to how you felt before, which we sometimes will call withdrawal. You're going through withdrawal from the substance. You're using the substance to feel better. And then you'd never get back to that original high or that initial relief of the substances, but you're always kind of chasing not feeling good. And so the substances end up, you, people continue to take them despite all the negative consequences because they're just trying to feel either normal or feel good. And it's that loss of control that maybe started with good intentions. I want to feel better, which I think we all do, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, but it ends up becoming the drug or the alcohol is the problem. And I see that a lot. I think that's a pretty common theme. Sure. So a, a patient comes into your office and they present with both mental health problems as well as addictive 
problem. So they're suffering from both. Where do you begin? That is a very good question. And so sometimes people will be very, I would say, insightful about it. And they'll say, you know what? I just got back from Iraq or Afghanistan. I got addicted to you know pills or, or substances and I have PTSD. But oftentimes they don't know. They just know their life is in shambles or sometimes they don't even recognize it. And it's a family member who's referred them to treatment or a friend who said, you have to see a doctor. You know, this is going so poorly. So I usually try to start where the patient is. If they come to me and they know, hey, I have anxiety and I have a drinking problem, we can start right there. And other times we have to start even more basic. And you know, we in the field, we talk about it's a pre-contemplative stage. It's basically a stage where somebody doesn't even really recognize the problems they have or the need to get the help. They might just know that they've gotten an ultimatum from a loved one. Their spouse has said, if you don't go you know, see a doctor, I'm leaving you. And so they know, all right, I'll go and see a doctor. So where I usually start is I try to figure out where the patient is. And if they come to me and they just say, I know that I'm having a lot of problems and I'm drinking too much, then I help them try to understand it. Because ultimately, um, I might know there's a problem there. But if I try and tell them that, I find that it'll make patients, sometimes, not all cases, you know, more resistant. That, that ad- the addiction is a really strong uh, force. And we often talk about denial, where the addiction actually makes it so somebody doesn't see all the problems. So where I usually try to begin is where the patient is and help them to start to see the bigger picture and see what those issues are. And then I work with them to try to identify it and come up with a treatment plan. But it can take time. You know, it's, it's not all patients start in the same place. Some of them start very, very early in the process. So one of the things I, I hear you saying is not only are you starting where the patient is, but you don't have a cookie cutter approach to working with your patients. Is that right? That's true. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're taught, but you don't really learn until you start working with you know, patients, especially with addiction, whether it's a chemical addiction, behavioral addiction. Once you've seen one patient, um, you've seen one patient. You know, the addiction is such a multifactorial disease. There's not one gene, not one area of the brain. Uh, people don't present with the same, you know, um, mix of mental health and substance abuse issues. And so it really is important. I think from my standpoint, I think it's one of the, uh, you know, the things that I bring to my patients that is helpful is that I'm, you know, I listen and I try to figure out what it is they need to get better and listen to them because they may have had experiences that were either good or bad in the past, where if, you know, if you have diabetes, there's certain medications or high blood pressure. There's certain meds we can address and check your lab. Um, but it, with mental health and addiction, you really have to approach every patient differently because their experiences are so different and what's going to work for them are so different. So I think it's a very collaborative effort is how I try to approach it with my patients. Right. I think collaborative is, is the optimal word. So the client feels mm-hmm. or the patient feels uh, that they're part of the team and they're, they're, they're are empowered to right. ask what they need and also to make it form decisions along the way. Now that that's terrific. Yep, so separate from that, I, I heard you use the word disease. And I'm always curious about how that works in terms of your perspective on addiction. And, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from with mm-hmm. sexual addiction and compulsive sexual behavior. There's a lot of controversy about whether it falls neatly under the disease model or not. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on your experience or ideas around the disease model and sex addiction? That's a great, you know, that's a great question. And it really is, I would say, I think you use the term controversial. There's so many different ways to look at it. Um, From my standpoint, you know, the way I make a diagnosis is I look at the DSM or I look at the ASAM, which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine definition of addiction. Um, And it's a brain disease and it's chronic and uh, causes problems with behavior. And then I look at the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that the American Psychiatric Association puts out that helps us to identify addictions. And there's basically 11 symptoms that range from loss of control to having consequences and continuing to use to having tolerance and withdrawal um, that have been modified for all chemical addictions, because it's really easy to you know, go from alcohol to, say, opiates or pain meds, since their symptoms are very similar. But when we try to apply those to behavioral uh, addictions, they've only been able to so far, and I think they're working on updating, and this is, I think, where some of the controversy the different opinions come in, is only been able to fit gambling use disorders into that same criterion. And obviously, it's a different spectrum, not having a chemical withdrawal the way you do from a substance with gambling, but people's moods will be affected and their temperament will be affected, so they've been able to kind of translate it. To my knowledge, they haven't been able to do that for other things like eating disorders and sex addictions or uh, you know sexual disorders 
borders, but I think they're working on it. And so I think it is hard because it doesn't as neatly fit into this criteria, but we see it in patients. We see that their, you know, their sexual compulsions will be causing negative consequences, and yet they still continue to engage in those behaviors. Uh, they might be putting themselves in harm's way, uh, causing problems with their you know, family members and friends and relationships. And so there are a lot of overlying criteria. And I see that people need to go through a process that involves, uh, you know, could involve biological treatments like medications, psychological treatments like therapy or going to residential or IOP treatment and social changes, you know, changing the people, places and things. So I don't think, you know, I think we have so much to learn for so many things in our field for mental health and addiction. But I think the sex addiction treatment world, I think there's so much um, more to learn. And I think hopefully we'll be able to bring it more into the same model of addictions that we use for other things. I see personally a lot of similarities and I've seen patients benefit from some of the same uh, kind of medicalization of the treatment of of chemical dependency as I have, you know, for those patients who have sex addictions, but I just don't think the literature and the research is 100% of the way there. And I'm hopeful we'll get there because I think we need more answers is how I look at it. I couldn't agree more. I think as much as we know, we're still learning. And when it comes to sex addiction, it's it's the newer kid on the block. Um, there's also yeah. video game addiction and other um, addictions that, that do affect the brain. And we know they, that they kind of hijack the brain in different ways. But I think when it comes to sex, primary controversy that I see is as a an identified um, problem, as uh, uh, now that the World Health Organization is calling it compulsive sexual behavior, there's a question of whether it fits neatly into the existing disease model. And there's a lot of folks who are concerned that it pathologizes sex or that it makes sex um, problematic somehow, rather than how do we focus on people having healthier sexual expression and and sexual uh, lives in general. So there's a lot to learn in, in all of that. So Along these lines, another controversy, which which I think is a, an important one, is that in 12-step programs, sometimes there is a belief that taking medication doesn't align with what we might call good recovery or, or healthy recovery of some sort. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that notion of how medication can actually reside side by side with recovery. That is a very hot topic. I've had, I think there's kind of three types of patients that I would say come to me and they're, you know, they're obviously somebody who would be working a 12-step program because they're interested to know, you know, will medications work with that? There are patients who say, my sponsor absolutely has told me that I can't be sober and take any sort of medication. Uh, There are some people who come come to me and will say, you know, my sponsor said whatever you need, you know, that to feel better is appropriate. And then there's people who are kind of in the middle, you know, they're like, I'm not sure, or, you know, I need to think about it. Um, And ultimately what I have found is is it's it, the the common thread for me has been the folks who are really hardlined about meds not being appropriate for 12 step recovery patients I should say who come to me and say that I can't do this it's not is it's because a lot of times their sponsor didn't use medication so it's basically I got sober this way and the only way you as my sponsee can get sober is the same way I did. And I didn't take meds, so you shouldn't either. I, I, you know, I've already talked about my approach, being very collaborative with my patients, um, listening to where they're at. So I don't think that's fair to put on somebody to say you have to get sober my way. Obviously, 12-step and, um, you know, recovery is a personal thing. So I don't want to tell any person how they should do the recovery, how they shouldn't. But at least as they're my patient, I approach them as, let's figure out what's best for you. So if you have such severe social anxiety that you can't speak at a meeting, you can't um, you know, get a promotion at work because you're too anxious to be able to speak up at a staff meeting or whatever it might be. And this is just one, you know, one uh, type of treatment somebody can need, say social anxiety or performance anxiety. I personally would recommend, if you're open to it, that you consider a medication that can help you to not have another reason to go back to drinking. So you have a really rough board meeting and your brain goes back to, I just need a drink to take the edge off, or I need a drink to social lubricant so I can go out and, and meet clients and, uh, you know, be successful at work. So I always try to give my patients the tools and and the knowledge they can make the right decisions for them. I always encourage them to consider all their options, especially if it's going to strengthen their recovery, decrease their risk of relapse and make them more successful. But I get it. I mean, there are really some people who are hardlined and say, absolutely not. Even if you took Zoloft for your anxiety or you took Propanolol for your performance-based anxiety, that's not sober. Um, And I feel that makes it tough on them because it closes off a lot of options. And like I said before, everyone's 
addiction and their mental health issues are, are different. So just because a sponsor did something one way isn't necessarily going to mean it might work well for my patient who's their sponsee. Um, but my goal is always just to educate them, give them their options, and then not put any pressure on them. It's their choice to make. And I hope whoever they're working with will give them the same, you know, the same tool sets to say, hey, here are all your tools um, and let's figure out which ones work best for you. But that's not always the case. And I'm sure you've seen it too, where there's pressure to do things certain ways. And one of those ways is to, you know, do this without med. Um, but that's been my experience. I, I love that approach. And I have been in the 12 step rooms for a long, long time, and I've seen a lot of suffering and continue to see a lot of suffering. And what I um, heard one time, and I'd like your opinion on this, is that sometimes when the suffering is so great, it really gets in the way of the healing process. And, and so it's one thing when somebody's learning to tolerate or endure some pain, that's part of recovery. But if somebody is truly suffering and, and having difficulties functioning and, and having relationships and um, getting out of bed in the morning, then it's, it's really, in, in essence, it becomes a bit of um, torment to say, well, medication is not the way to go. And, you know, a colleague once said that, that medication is like a cast. And you put on the cast and the cast is there in order for you to strengthen other parts of you to, to build your coping mechanisms, your ego strengths, to, pre to prepare you for having a, a bigger and better recovery. And I, I like that, that image because I think that it's not a forever thing for a lot of people. Some people go on long-term meds, but oftentimes it is a cast for a year or two or more. And um, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that, that idea of wearing the cast for a certain period of time. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that idea. Um, and, and you painted a good picture. Somebody who's so depressed, they're having trouble getting up out of bed in the morning. They've got no interest in doing things. They're feeling guilty and hopeless. They're not eating well. I mean, beyond either their behavioral addiction or their chemical addiction, their substance abuse, they have, you know, major depressive disorder and they're really depressed. And it's really hard to engage in anything, let alone changing your life and finding new meaning and purpose if you're literally struggling just to get out of bed. And so I agree. I mean, I think if somebody can take a medication to help them get to a place where they can actually engage fully in recovery and work a full 12 step program. To me, it enhances it. And it is, like you said, it's not a long-term thing. I usually recommend four to six months of doing well and then look at getting off the med. But the idea is, and that's how that those tools work together, is if you're so anxious or you're so depressed that you can't get to meetings, you can't participate, you're too depressed to do step work, um, you know, that's beyond the addiction. That's the part of the mental health that's a separate but related issue. And so if medications can help, you know, put on a cap or get you to a place where you can fully engage, I always think that that's going to be much you know, better than ignoring that or, or not giving that as an option. Um, so I agree with you. I think that's important. Sure. And once in a while, I'll have somebody come in and talk with me and they'll say, you know, I, I want to do some therapy, but I hear that there's some medications out there now that can actually cure addiction. And I'm wondering if you could address that issue, the idea of medications curing addiction. Sure. Yeah, we there are a few meds that are used commonly in uh, you know addiction treatment. So for alcohol, there's three. There's antabuse, a uh, antabuse and a campersate. Those both can help decrease cravings. Uh, and then there's naltrexone, which can decrease cravings. Actually, I'm getting myself confused. So antabuse and a campersate are often used uh, for alcohol in different ways. So antabuse is one that if you were to drink, it can make you sick. Uh, a campersate can decrease cravings, and then naltrexone is the one. That it can also decrease cravings. Uh, and if you did drink, can and decrease the severity or frequency or the length of the relapse. Uh, in opiates and in, in, uh, pain medications, you can also use notrexone for similar things, decrease cravings and potentially block the relapse. The, the thing that I think people sometimes get confused is that these are just tools similar to the meds that we just talked about to help your mental health that can help you know get you to a place where you can engage in full recovery, but they actually won't get or keep you sober. So none of these things will help you to discover uh, uh, you know, what it is that might have led you to drugs or alcohol or some of these behavioral addictions. None of them will help you develop new healthy behaviors or coping skills. Uh, none of them will help you to re-engage in a social community or support network. And we know those are the things that are important uh, for somebody to get sober. And the other thing it teaches us, you know, these medications is because it's not just a purely biological disease, you know, addiction does affect the brain, but it affects the brain in so many areas and it affects the behavior in so many areas. 
that a medication alone isn't going to be enough to get somebody sober. Or if you have sex addiction, you can't just take a med and be able to be in recovery or to, to be able to get you quote unquote cured from it because it's not just a, a biological medication issue. So the role I look at as meds is they can help to keep somebody sober, help to decrease their, uh, you know, their cravings. It can help to, um, you know, provide another incentive with abuse that if you drink, you might get really sick. And so these can help as tools or as safety nets uh, as part of a larger recovery program. But they're certainly not going to be a silver bullet where you can just take these and, you know, get sober. So I think as long as somebody knows what they're useful for and what they aren't going to help with, it's just another set of options that, you know, somebody can consider, uh, you know, to help enhance their recovery. I really appreciate the idea of medications as tools, because I, I think that there sometimes is a fantasy that the medication will be the answer. And as we know, oftentimes there's so many underlying issues that have contributed to the compulsive or addictive behavior and, and or that have resulted in different challenges because of the addictive compulsive behavior. So in some ways, it doesn't matter whether the, the issues mental health wise started beforehand or after they need to be addressed in conjunction with the medication. And that, that's why I, I love collaborating with you, Dr. Goldenberg, and, and really enjoy understanding from an addiction psychiatry specialty what distinguishes, you know, the average uh, approach to um, psychopharmacology uh, from what it means to really be an integrated approach to work on addiction recovery. And that's actually the segue to my next question, which is, what, what is the difference between sobriety and recovery? So that's a nuanced question. I think if you ask 10 people, you'll probably get 10 answers. But since you asked me, I will give you mine. The way I look at sobriety is really abstaining from that drug or alcohol or drugs and alcohol altogether, uh, preferably, or that behavior, if let's say you, you had mentioned like excessive video game playing, so sobriety might be, you know, extinguishing that the inappropriate behavior. Maybe you're playing video games, but not in excess amount of time where it's causing problems, or maybe some sobriety is, you know, not playing video games at all. So I guess the, the question is, is what do we and the question you asked me is, what do we call sobriety? And so for me, it could either be total abstinence or it could be um, extinguishing that problematic behavior. And for some people, that's not possible. You know, if, if you have a really severe alcohol use disorder, uh, it's very hard, if not impossible, to just drink a little bit. I mean, we'd all like that to be true. But for that person, real sobriety might be, you know, fully abstaining from alcohol. A step farther than that is uh, recovery. And so sometimes when we talk about people who are not in recovery, we might call them a dry drunk. So, you know, we often will hear about, oh, my uncle Jim, he gave up alcohol, but he was still just a mean sober drunk. Um, and so that's sometimes what we'll see folks who are in sobriety, uh, at least from their substance, but not in good recovery. And so what recovery to me is, is really building a new life uh, without drugs, alcohol, or whatever that uh, maladaptive behavior, that behavior that was, you know, the problem that they were coming to treatment for. And so it's really looking at getting rid of not only those negative behaviors. So if we use alcohol as an easy example, it's not just getting rid of the alcohol drinking, but it's actually promoting healthy behaviors. So finding meaning and purpose, happiness and joy, uh, so that that person has a new life, not only without that substance, and they're thinking to themselves, oh, what am I missing out on? But they've actually been able to incorporate new healthy behaviors so that there's no reason that they would want to. And there's no reason why their brain would need to go back to feel better from that old life. Because a lot of times it's the lack of those healthy behaviors that leads the brain to need a substance to feel better. And so essentially recovery is figuring out a new life where you're feeling better from the people you're engaging with, from the, the things that you're doing. Um, and uh, you are sober in addition to that. So it's that additional step of um, you know, building a new life that, to me, distinguishes recovery from simply just, you know, being absent or being sober. But I think everyone looks at it differently. I'm curious to know if that's how you look at it or do you see it differently? I see it very similarly. The, the one thing I would add, because I love the idea of building a, a better life, is it's not just an external process. It's both building a better life externally and internally. 
and yeah, and it's sure. a deeper healing and it's 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 not only healing from the past but it's finding a way to enjoy the future and really be oneself fully and find ways of of finding contentment and peace and calm and uh love and and harmony in 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 every which way which is something that we all do whether we're in recovery or not but I, I think that um, deeper recovery, it, it doesn't have to be in a 12-step program. I think 12 steps offer amazing tools, but it can be any kind of healing recovery that um, helping somebody live their life in a way that, that really fits for them better. So yes, I, I absolutely agree with what you said and, and just want to emphasize that it's that internal work that is, is so um, meaningful and hopefully sustainable. Agree, yeah. Yeah. So here we are in the middle of the pandemic, and this has presented some challenges, actually both for clinicians and for patients in different ways. And I'm wondering if you can mention your ideas, your perspective on how it challenges people in, in recovery or seeking recovery. There are definitely a lot of challenges. I mean, one of the most common things I'm seeing is whether you have addiction or not, people are drinking more. People are home. They have less going on. Their social activities are really cut down. And so uh, one of the things we know about alcohol and you know, drug addictions is that the more people who are exposed to a substance, the more likely people are to develop addictions. And so the more people who are at home drinking and using drinking to cope, uh, you know, the more people, I think one challenge is that there are going to be more people who are really struggling with this uh, and maybe who had never struggled before because this is a challenge that I think we've all had to face, uh, you know, due to this pandemic where, you know, there might be people who haven't ever had to deal with something like this in their lives, taking away their normal activities and friends and family. So that's one challenge, I think, is that we're uh, faced with a crisis and people are drinking more and using drugs more and, uh, you know, other things to kind of cope. Another challenge for somebody who's seeking recovery or seeking help is that a lot of the tools that we recommend, you know, the, the very basic things I recommend is you want to be around people. You want to be accountable. Uh, you want to try to get to meetings, whether it be 12 step meetings or, you know, some other form of mutual help meetings or church, whatever it means to you. Um, you, you know, you don't want to be around the people, places and things. If you tend to drink at home alone, you want to get out and, and do new activities. And the hard part, obviously, goes without saying with, with the coronavirus is we're not able to do a lot of those things. A lot of the, you know, churches are closed down. A lot of our 12-step meetings have gone online and on Zoom. Um, it's harder to be of service. You know, we talk about getting outside of yourself and being of service to others. Um, and it's harder to do that when your connections are all through the Internet and through, you know, video. And so one of the challenges that I've really had to help my patients with is, finding appropriate treatment, even the IOP and residential programs that people will normally go into and be able to engage in full time and be in, in, around people. You know, a lot of those have transitioned to video as well, just because you know, in a best case, you have to get uh, a coronavirus test and you have to be quarantined to make sure the test is negative. And so a lot of programs have had to you know, put in place different measures to keep the patients who are in treatment safe. So I think a big challenge is trying to be creative and figure out how do we help somebody who's going through a crisis, crisis that we all are going through and we have no idea when it will end, be able to you know, muster the resources they need and change their day-to-day -day life enough to be able to be successful. And so I think it takes just some creativity uh, and it takes collaboration. So you mentioned you know, I enjoy working with you as well. And I think that you know, having a, a good therapist involved potentially having a really strong sponsor involved, maybe even a life coach, whatever it takes to have a team around to help the person make these big, as you said, internal changes as well as external changes, um, because the things that are usually readily available to us and work so well are just a little bit more difficult or challenging to, access, uh, to get access to. So I think that's, uh, that's the, the challenge to overcome is how do we build a team for somebody um, so that they can be successful. So in this case, it, it not only takes a village, but it takes a virtual village, and it takes a lot of right. creativity to find ways to bring people together, whether it be through video conferencing or in whatever shape or form that allows people to stay more connected, because connection, of course, is one of the cornerstones of, of recovery. So yes, I, I think this is um, one of our biggest challenges right now. 
So one thing I wanted to end with today has to do with relapse. Most of our listeners know that relapse is actually part of addiction, part of the pattern of compulsive behavior. And they also know that there's warning signs. There's actually um, words nowadays like prelapse to kind of notice what are those slippery slopes that people go down towards actually going into a full relapse. And I'm wondering if a patient walks in and says, Dr. Goldenberg, I just relapsed and um, I, I could use your guidance, right? I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what we can do because I, I just don't want to go down this road anymore. How would you address that kind of person? So there's a lot of different ways to look at relapse. And I think a lot of times in the example you gave, when somebody says, I just relapsed and what should I do? They're talking about a, a, a physical, or I call a physical relapse. So they've either gone back to the behavior that they were trying not to engage in, or you know they're using the drug or alcohol or drugs and alcohol again. And so as you mentioned, there's other ways to look at it. And sometimes people will call it prelapse. I look at relapse as three separate kind of stages. Uh, The first one being an emotional relapse. So if somebody is, let's say, trying to be sober from alcohol um, and they start to have anxiety or depression or um, they're going through a period of grief, there's an emotion or a behavior where this might have been a similar pattern from before, uh, where let's say they were drinking to cope with the loss of a loved one. And now another family member has died, and so they're back into a similar emotional state. Or it could be a new one. You know, before they had lost a failed spouse, let's say, and the depression led them to drink. Now they've lost a job, and so similar kind of grieving process. And that would be considered an emotional relapse, and we could call that maybe a pre-relapse. The next phase that people go through is what I look at as a mental relapse. So we often will look at that more as the behaviors. So the people, places, and things. So they'll talk about, oh, you know, I'm not drinking, but I started going back to the poker game with the guys, uh, or I'm going to the bar, but I'm just getting a seltzer. And so one of the things that, you know, we hear about in the rooms a lot is you can only go to the barber so many times until you get a haircut. And so the idea is with the mental relapse is you're putting yourself in a position, uh, whether you realize it or intend to or not, where the addiction is getting really close to getting to a physical relapse. And sometimes it's the addiction itself that essentially is confusing us or has us in denial that we somehow can go to uh, a bar, even though alcohol has been, you know, the problem that we had and and not drink. And so what often happens next is it slides into a physical relapse. And the drink itself may look like it was really spontaneous. Oh, I have no idea. You know, my family went away for the weekend and I just picked up a drink and didn't think about it. But when you take a step back and you look at the process that went down, It can often be over weeks or months where the behavior started slipping, stopped going to meetings, started hanging out with the old friends, started getting more depressed. And then it looks like it's spontaneous, but this physical relapse, the actual relapse they're talking about, uh, occurred over a longer period of time. So I think one of the first things I challenge my patients to look at is let's look at when this really started. It probably didn't start the night that you picked up the drink. And the next thing is trying to figure out as you said, well, what do we do? And oftentimes patients want to know, well, what do I do to prevent this? And so it's really important to look back at what was missing from the recovery program that beyond just being sober, what do we need to put in? Is it more connections, more accountability, um, you know, whatever it might be, so that you don't slip through those emotional and mental stages of relapses and miss them? Because that's ultimately what needs to happen is we need to catch it where a sponsor or a spouse or a friend can say, hey, it looks like you're really stressed out again. You know, have you looked at your anxiety? Have you been talking to your therapist about it or, what, or your, your sponsor about it? So the idea for me is to do what sometimes they'll call a relapse autopsy, really look at like what happened along the way, and then try to put a plan in place to address, sometimes we'll call it like a Swiss cheese model, trying to plug up those holes so that it doesn't get missed again. So hopefully next time, way before you get to a phase where you're about to pick up the drink or engage in that behavior, There's been things that are put in place to catch it and to get back on track so that it doesn't feel like it was totally out of control uh, since we have, you know, a a larger playing field to look at. We don't just have to look at the last couple of yards before the the relapse happens. So those are kind of generally how I'll start to look at a relapse if somebody comes to me asking about it. That has to be one of the simplest and easiest ways of thinking about relapse that I've ever heard. It, the idea of emotional, mental, and physical is something that all of our listeners can keep an eye on. 
whether it's for them or for loved ones. And, and the Swiss cheese is such a great image. So I, I appreciate that. And, and that really captures a lot and, and uh, in a wonderful way for people to hold on to what relapse is really all about. So that's just about all the time we have for today. I, I, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Goldenberg, for being a part of our podcast today. And I want to let our listeners know that you have a website. It's www.docgoldenberg.com at gmail.com. And Dr. Goldenberg can be reached at his Santa Monica office at 424 Two seven six zero seven seven seven, and once again, I, I so appreciate you joining us today. And I'm sure our paths will continue to cross from time to time. So take good care, and and I I certainly hope you and all your loved ones are safe and well, Doctor Goldenberg. Thank you, Sam. It was great to be here with you. Take good care. Thank you for listening today. It was really terrific having Dr. Goldenberg share the time with us today and discussing this really vital topic of psychopharmacology and addiction recovery. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on iTunes or please share our podcast on Spotify. And if there are topics you would like us to discuss in the future, please let us know. I look forward to you joining us on future podcasts and thanks again for being with us today.